Connected Education, Part 1, Another Click in the Wall. For the past two years, I've been invited to judge the Young ICT Explorers event in New South Wales. And last year, there were nearly 200 students from 28 schools that came throughout the state to Uni New South Wales on a soggy August Saturday morning. They were ready to show the judges what they could do in ICT. And the judges, there's a whole squadron of us. We fan out amongst the students and look at their projects. The students are separated from any teachers or any parents who could coach them. And every project team gets 15 minutes with a small group of judges. So students pitch their project and the judges ask any questions that come to mind. Now the students frequently spend months working on these projects. And they're getting very valuable feedback from the judges who tend to be IT industry professionals. The judges get to experience the infectious ingenuity and inventiveness of someone who is brand new to the field. I always come away from the day buzzing with all sorts of ideas. Last year was no different. And while many of the student projects are quite accomplished, a few tend to stand out far above the others. One of the last projects that I judged that morning was fronted by a single student who was next to this great big large white box. He'd mounted a wall clock on it, and underneath the clock, inset into the box, colorful text was scrolling by on an LED display. And the student explained that his playground at Waranga Public School scheduled separate play periods for the various years. And he showed how this clock on a box informed students who was permitted on the playground at the time. It would tell them via those bright LEDs. So he studied a real problem in his school and he engineered a real solution. And I do mean engineered because that LED display wasn't just some off the shelf bit of kit that you could buy at a hobby shop. It was wired directly to a sophisticated computer which is known as a Raspberry Pi. That's a $35 credit card sized gadget similar to the guts inside of a smartphone. The student had learned how to manipulate signals coming out of the Raspberry Pi in order to drive that LED display. He'd learned how to program the display. He'd learned how to write a sophisticated software program to control the Raspberry Pi so the right messages would display at the right times of day. And I have to admit, I was gobsmacked. I have seen uni graduate students in computer science who display less depth in ICT than this grade six student did. Now, I was really suspicious that maybe a parent or a teacher had fabricated the device. And so we asked a series of technical questions about the construction and operation. And this 11-year-old answered those questions flawlessly. He detailed every step in his creative process. He wasn't faking it. He really knew his stuff. Where did you learn all of this? I asked finally. Oh, he said, well, I watched some videos on Adafruit. Now established in 2008 as a website to educate adults in the wonders of modern electronics, something that's now known as the maker movement, Adafruit provides extensive written and video tutorials on a broad set of topics in electrical engineering and computer software. I've used it myself over the years, and I found it very useful when I'm trying to master a new skill. But I'd never considered what might happen when someone with a boundless capacity for learning, which pretty much describes your average 11-year-old, when they would mind meld with the wealth of material that was available through Adafruit. And in a few months, the student went from knowing next to nothing to a fairly comprehensive foundation in electrical engineering and computer science just by leading into his desire to learn. He won the big prize that morning, and he certainly deserved it. I came away wondering whether this isn't the way we should be teaching every child, helping them find something that completely obsesses them, and then turning them loose. We couldn't do that even a decade ago because none of us had access to the overwhelming resources of knowledge and experience that are now parts of daily life. And I want you to remember that point because we are going to come back to it. Now, the second prize that morning in the year 5-6 category went to a girl. She built a computer-controlled smart cage door for her pet guinea pig. Her pet guinea pig had been nearly killed by a qual who got into the cage one evening because the door was up. Both of those innovations 
are practical, both are sophisticated, both reflect the growing maker movement, which asks people to DIY their own gadgets rather than simply accepting the newest and shiniest from Apple or Samsung or whoever. But you have to educate yourself before you can do it yourself. Each of the prize-winning kids creating these projects benefited from an explicit educational focus at the core of the materials they were using to build their projects on. The computer that was controlling the guinea pig cage door was invented by a group of Italian makers. In 2005, they launched something they called Arduino, an easy-to-program single-chip computer. And it took oh, about a half a decade to take off. But Arduino has eventually become an entry point for hundreds of thousands, probably actually millions of individuals, to experiment with the design of computer circuitry. There are courses in Arduino taught at university level, and there's more than a few primary and secondary schools that are also teaching Arduino. And the Arduino community connects online. Thousands of hobbyists are out there ready to answer a question or help with a solution or simply demonstrate their own cool project. All of that information can be had with nothing more than a Google search. Case in point, as I was writing that last paragraph, I wondered if anyone had modified the Scratch programming language, which is a simple, powerful, drag and drop programming language created at MIT's Media Lab. I wonder if someone had modified it so it could be used to program Arduino. So I typed Scratch plus Arduino into the locator tab in my browser and up came S4A, Scratch for Arduino. So many people have done so much with Arduino and documented it so thoroughly online that answers are rarely more than a click away. Now, after Arduino has achieved some success, another group of engineers, this time they were out of the UK, they decided that kids needed an even more sophisticated computer, something closer to what you might find in a late model smartphone with a lot of memory, a networking, a sophisticated operating system. Their goal wasn't to teach kids how to use computers, but to create a computer that could teach kids how computers worked. And from that came the Raspberry Pi, this $35 credit card sized computer that runs the Linux operating system and can do just about anything that any other computer can do. You can attach it to a telly, add a keyboard and Wi-Fi, and all of a sudden a kid has everything they need to explore the world of computing. And that smart 11 year old had used it for the cornerstone of his first place project. And again, Arduino. Like the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi has a community of hundreds of thousands who are sharing what they know with one another. Almost any problem anyone encounters has been encountered and solved by someone else, so the solution to most problems lie no more than a Google search away. Now, both Arduino and Raspberry Pi highlight a new learning style. It's one that was impossible until just a few years ago, but it's a style that will become increasingly common. Part two, Piaget's children. So to trace this new learning style to its origins, we need to go back to the early years of the 20th century. And while William James and Sigmund Freud were making inroads into understanding human psychology, the mind of the child remained largely unknown, largely unremarkable. A hundred years ago, people believed that children thought like uneducated adults. Now, through some research that was so simple only a genius could have thought of it, that's what Einstein said about it, a single scientist upended all of these unquestioned assumptions about the mind of the child, and he did this by doing nothing more than carefully studying his own children as they grew up. And it's amazing, it's actually a little bit embarrassing, to contemplate that before this, no one had believed the mind of the child had warranted serious study. But this amazing Swiss, Jean Piaget, quickly learned that children were not merely uneducated adults. The mind of the child, he found, is, is something else entirely. It's a reality testing, a theorem proving machine. From the moment we come into the world, our interactions within the world give rise to certain understandings, some beliefs, some assumptions about the way the world works. And 
a child is constantly putting those beliefs to the test. And where those beliefs are proven, they get incorporated into a philosophical framework of how the world works. Where those beliefs fail, well, the child starts again from first principles. And in those failures, the child learns the limit of the world and the limits of their understanding. That process, Piaget named constructivism. It doesn't need to be taught. It's part of the innate toolkit of every person. Constructivism forms the primary learning technique of the child. And so, far from unsophisticated or unlearned, children are great practitioners of the scientific method. They develop theories and conduct experiments to put those theories to the test. Now, constructivism has another, more familiar English phrasing, learning by doing. And where once we thought that this applied to specific sorts of tasks, Piaget showed how learning by doing frames every moment of the child's experience of the world. Nothing, nothing is ignored. Everything gets incorporated into the individual's structure of understanding. Nothing is irrelevant. Now, Piaget's career spanned most of the 20th century, and by the post-war period, he had attracted a school of pupils, each of whom applied Piaget's fundamental insight to their own work. One of those, an engaging South African by the name of Seymour Papert, had by the early 1960s ended up at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now at the time, MIT was leading the world in the brand new field of computing. It was developing technologies that would enable computers to listen and to respond to humans. To listen and respond, those computers would need some intelligence of their own. So one of the grand projects at MIT in those early days was work on what they called artificial intelligence. It was broadly believed by scientists that we'd have thinking computers in relatively short order. And that's a funny point because it's an embarrassing one. The nature of human intelligence at that point in the 1950s, early 1960s, it was pretty much as unexamined as the mind of the child had been 50 years before. You could teach a computer how to play chess, and, and those scientists were all chess players, so they considered chess the exemplar of intelligence. But it turns out that it's not, and artificial intelligence didn't really go anywhere because we didn't understand what human intelligence was. But Papert, Papert was one of the MIT boffins who was working very hard on the problem of artificial intelligence. And because he'd understood, understudied under Jean Piaget for five years, he had an abiding interest in human intelligence in the mind of the child. And he reframed questions in artificial intelligence as more general questions about human intelligence. Could constructivist methods be applied to the computer so that the human could educate it and themselves through a process of exploration. And so from that line of inquiry, Papert developed the Logo programming language. Logo has the distinction of being the first language explicitly designed to be used by children because it embeds with its, within its design the constructivist process of experimentation, theorizing, learning by doing. The logo language consists of a few simple words. Those wor words can be combined into compound statements. Those can be put together into more complex compound statements, and so on. To facilitate the learning process, logo was designed for interactive exploration. You type its words into a terminal and it responds immediately. That was a very new and exciting idea in the mid-1960s. And every child's experience of logo is unique because a child is going to develop their own original compound statements drawn from their own learning by doing. Logo co-evolves with the child's understanding. To reinforce the sense of experiment and play essential to the constructivist mindset, Piaget also created what he called the logo turtle. 
The turtle allows logo programs to draw graphics directly to the display. Interactive computer graphics were almost entirely unknown before logo, but became its most important feature because children could see how their logo programs changed the display and how those changes in their program changed what got drawn to the display. And that close coupling between theorizing and seeing the experimental evidence of those theories drawn on the screen, that dramatically accelerated the speed at which children could grasp, could learn logo. Now, 20 years after he arrived at MIT, Papert got a new graduate student named Mitchell Resnick. He wanted to create tools for lifelong learning. And Logo had had a long and successful history in education computing, but Resnick wanted to break down the barriers between the virtual world of the computer and the tangible world of things. And a decade of research led to a partnership with Lego and the creation of Lego Mindstorms. It's the combination of a relatively powerful computer, which is capable of driving a range of motors and reading from a bunch of different sensors, and it's married to a graphical programming language in which programming became a series of drag and drop actions with the mouse. And you put that together, you get a constructivist platform for building robots. Kids could play with Legos, which is a toy that already embodies constructivist principles. You could connect them together, you could experiment, you could program, you can learn by doing. When it was released in 1998, Mindstorms became a huge seller for Lego, and that was at $500 a set. It showed that all children and a fair few adults, they hungered for an opportunity to play, to experiment, to theorize, and through all of that to learn. Now, learning had a new aspect because just as Mindstorms hit the market, uh, that was when the web began to take off. And Lego created a website where they invited Mindstormers to upload their own designs, to learn from one another. Mindstormers populated bulletin boards, websites, educational conferences, science fairs. A technology connected became a community. Now, although Piaget's tech discovery of constructivism defines a landmark in a study of how we learn. It's not the only technique available to us. Of equal importance is mimesis. That's our ability to ape the actions of others. Children watch their parents. They watch their older siblings. They watch their peers, more or less that order. And through these careful observations, they learn how to perform specific tasks. <laughs> Well, in 2015, we can watch everyone everywhere. We have peers across the planet. There's three billion people regularly using the internet. So there's plenty of people to imitate. There's plenty to learn from. Much of what Mindstorms had going for it was timing. It was the first real opportunity to leverage the creative capability of everyone playing with Mindstorms at once. Mindstorms has always been a shared experience. As people learned, they shared what they learned, and other people copied them. So that combination of constructivism and the mimesis of billions of people, what I call hypermimesis, that defines the learning environment for the 21st century. That's the new learning style for both children and adults. In 2006, Resnick stripped the programming environment for Lego's Mindstorms out took out the robot elements, and he released it as the Scratch programming language to a moderate level of success. Kids as young as six, seven, eight, they were learning how to code with drag and drop blocks of Scratch. They used them to animate a little sprite on the screen. Now, 14 months ago, one of Resnick's postgraduate students rewrote Scratch from the ground up, and this time, they put it all inside of a web browser. And so there's no software to install. You just go to scratch.mit.edu, click on Create, and you start learning. But putting Scratch on the web, it makes it easy for anyone who writes a Scratch program to share that program through the Scratch website because it's living on the Scratch website. And as a result, today, there are almost 8 million Scratch programs 
on scratch.mit.edu. And every one of those programs can be inspected by anyone else who wants to learn Scratch. Eight million examples, eight million ways to imitate and learn from others. It provides a very broad foundation for hypermimesis. And Scratch programs can now be quickly embedded in any web page anywhere on the web. That means that a child can share their work easily and immediately with anyone, with everyone. You can go looking for a Scratch program, but it's just as easy now for a Scratch program to find you. Now, at the 2013 YICTI event, I saw a few Scratch programs here and there. Schools were really just starting to teach it, and that was before the release of the web-based Scratch 2.0. Now, last year, after that release, just about half of all the YICTI projects I judged incorporated a Scratch program. It had become so easy for these students to experiment on their own in a web browser, so easy for them to learn from the examples of millions of others, that it suddenly became a no-brainer. Millions of children now learn how to program using an educational methodology that Jean Piaget would find familiar. Piaget did not live to see the rise of networks and the potentials offered by hypermimesis, but his students have and they've crafted a new learning style for a new century. And now it's time for us to take that methodology and apply it to other areas of education. Part three, all together now. 37 years ago, I was lucky enough to be attending a high school that offered a computer science course. I'd learned about the new course from my math teacher. He thought I'd do well in the course. I signed up immediately. Now, back in 1978, computers weren't very common, but the school administration generously granted us access to its time-sharing mini-computer so us students could learn how to program. I do remember that there was a fairly big classroom, 15 of us, fairly evenly divided between boys and girls, each of us patiently queuing for a chance to type our programs on a terminal. And that first course served as a foundation for much of what I've achieved through the arc of my career. I migrated through a series of software engineering jobs in the 1980s at one job within a tiny division of a huge American telco. About a third of the programming staff were women. And that was the last time I saw pretty much anything like that during my professional career in computing. By the time I got to one of my favorite jobs, this is a classic technology startup, I was one of 13 male engineers before we hired a woman into an engineering role and she happened to be the wife of the founder. Something happened in the dozen years between my first computer science course and that job. Something had driven almost all of the women from the field. And it hadn't always been like this. My auntie, who recently turned 75, began her career as a mathematician and programmer working for NASA. Before the 1980s, lots of women established careers as programmers and software architects. So what changed? Well, the personal computer industry grew explosively in the early 1980s, specifically by marketing its products to young men. I want you to think about this. The 1983 film War Games. Matthew Broderick using his skills as a hacker to save the world from Armageddon. Girlfriend Ali Sheedy looks on approvingly, but never touches a computer. And that's the beginning of a story about what computers are and how we use them. A story that completely excludes women. And that idea began to seep into mainstream culture. Middle-class families in America and Australia would buy their sons PCs and they would keep their daughters well away. As more boys spent time with computers, they gained skills that put them far ahead of girls who lacked that exposure. And so by the middle of the 1980s, a girl enrolling in a computer science course at a university faced a severe disadvantage when compared to her male peers, most of whom had already been programming computers for several years. And in this way, a chasm became a gulf. And by the early 1990s, women had pretty much been driven by, from computing. And this is my problem. You see, 
I really truly love computing. More than this, I discovered my love of teaching because I had taught programming courses in the mid-1990s, and that led me from a career as a software engineer into a career as an educator. But I've recently become intensely aware that the field that I loved has been twisted almost to the point of misogyny by the lack of women within it. Women were driven out of the field, and the lack of women in the field has created a comfortable set of self-reinforcing assumptions about the maleness of computing. We imagine a computer geek, and we don't conjure up the image of a girl. And that's actually quite odd, because my experience judging young ICT explorers has shown me that the majority of projects from year five and six come from girls. The urge to geek out with computers is clearly present in both sexes, but by the time you get to the year 10 and 11 students, it's largely boys presenting projects. The girls have given up their pursuit of the field. I believe the reason for this, and I will freely admit that this is a hypothesis, it's not a proven fact, but I believe the reason is that computing has become so male identified, the girls, in the midst of establishing their own identity in a community of peers, they tend to stay away. I mean, flip the example around. How many boys would take courses in something that's particularly female identified? This is a time in life when both sexes are struggling with their roles. Computing is culturally framed as the domain of men, and for that reason, girls are unlikely to take a risk. And if they do take a risk, they confront a world that persists in seeing computing as no place for a woman. We can go back two generations and see the same sorts of assumptions being made about medicine, accepting pediatrics, and the law. Former Governor General Quentin Bryce was the first woman to pass the bar in Queensland. So within living memory, the legal profession was closed to women, which is a state of affairs that seems absolutely ridiculous to us today. And it is ridiculous. It needs to stop. And you have everything needed to initiate that change. A single-sex educational institution offers women a unique opportunity to explore their capacities in ways that would be much more difficult in a mixed-sex environment. You can encourage women to study computing and, more broadly, STEM. You can frame it to seem perfectly normal. You can deliver a curriculum to create the kind of women we want to have running the world in the next two generations. And that's what I'm asking of you. The problem has gone on too long, but it's within your power to close the gap. Last weekend, I was lucky enough to witness his Generation Entrepreneur, which is a sort of weekend-long boot camp for technology entrepreneurs. But here's the twist. All of these entrepreneurs were still in high school. And over 48 hours, these kids pitched their best ideas, they built teams, and then participated in a competition to determine who had developed the most compelling idea. What I really liked about Generation Entrepreneur is that over half of the participants were girls. The pattern I'd seen in Yikti, where over half of the year five and six participants are girls, that was repeated with girls in years 11 and 12. So these barriers that bar women from careers in IT, they can be surmounted. It might not even be terrifically hard. We just have to give it some sustained focus. Okay, so let's take that challenge and raise the bar. In an age of shared knowledge where everyone is learning from everyone else, I want you to take what you do to the world. There are other girls here in Melbourne, throughout Australia, around the world who are facing the same challenges. These are would-be scientists and engineers and they need your support to help them make their way upstream against a prevailing attitude that diminishes the contributions of women. What you do for your students here, I ask you to share with the world. We live in a culture of sharing, and that culture of sharing has given us capacities beyond anything we possessed just a few years ago. This school can become a beacon for girls who want to go where few women have gone before. Everything you learn about how to empower women will be useful to women everywhere. If you share your work, you can empower half the planet. And this is easier than it might seem because we learn by doing and we learn by the doings of others. You are not alone. And while you should take the lead, you will not lead alone. Transforming learning and empowering women are one and the same act. We'll spend the next few decades transforming education into a mix of learning by doing and learning by the doing of others. We need to build up a rich storehouse of tools and techniques that we can draw on. And we do not need to reinvent any wheels. Where someone has shared a solution, we should use it. For example, 
15 months ago, mathematician and entrepreneur Stephen Wolfram announced that Mathematica, his firm's fully visual learn-by-doing mathematics software, would be released for the Raspberry Pi at no charge. For anyone learning mathematics beyond the basics, Mathematica is an incredible tool that brings numbers to life with fully interactive tools, graphs, visualizations, a sort of mathematics spreadsheet. It takes the abstractions that students struggle with and makes it all quite com concrete. And that's the reason that Mathematica is used by professionals in all sorts of science fields to help them with their complex math projects. Now, Mathematica's standard version costs $3,000. But Wolfram has clearly seen the value of training a new generation of kids to use the tool, because a lot of them are going to become paying customers someday. But it also means that we now have two elements in place to transform mathematics instruction, because Mathematica provides the constructivist learning by doing platform, but the Raspberry Pi community, which is already very well connected, provides the hypermimesis, the learning by the doing of others, that gets kids learning from one another. Now that Mathematica revolution, it's going to take a few years to play out. It's big, it's rich, it's complex, it's got a lot of features. It's going to take some time before educators and students really crack the nut and learn best how to explore the world of maths. But the process has begun. So can we take that methodology? It's the same methodology that brought us the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi and the Scratch. And can we apply it to other areas? IT is great. Maths is better. We need to do this for all of STEM. We need to do it everywhere else. The whole world can learn all the time. We know how this works now, and there are enough examples. We know what must be done and how to do it. The 21st century classroom is no longer a place with four walls and a whiteboard. The classroom is not a place, it's an attitude, and almost anything we want to learn is now within our power to master. That's true for an 11-year-old and a 52-year-old. Many of these learning by doing tools, such as Mathematica, already exist. We need to find them. We need to get them into the hands of students. They need to be brought online, nurtured by communities of interest who will explore, who will answer questions, who will offer examples, who will teach one another. And we need to share what we find because this process of connecting education is itself a process that we can bring into this methodology. We can learn by doing as we explore these tools. We can learn from others as we learn what tools others have found and how they've used them. And this talk is an example of that methodology put into practice because it features both what I've learned from myself and what I've learned from others. There's nothing unusual about that. This is the way we learn. But now, 20 years into the web era, we know enough of how to lean into this process to get our best results from it. And we must remember that passion provides the spark that ignites the fires of learning. It doesn't matter whether you're 9 or 90. We orient ourselves toward our passions. That might be sport or history or tech or pop stars. And we bury ourselves in websites and communities and social media and share and learn everything we can about the things we love. Sometimes that content is trivial. It doesn't matter because the way we're learning now is revolutionary. That's the world we already live in. Now we need to bring what we learn and how we learn into harmony with how we live. And when we do that, we will have given birth to connected education.